Hi everyone and welcome to ACCAP4 live session 4. In live session 4, we're supposed to be learning um, chapter 6, which is capital asset pricing model and the adjusted present value. But as we all know, we left the chapter number 5, um, theories of gearing last week. So I'm going to quickly pick it from theories of gearing and then we come back to um, the objective for the day. So let's go to chapter 5, which you can pick it from your lecture note from page 91. So let's go straight to chapter number 5. So chapter number 5, we're going to look at theories of gearing. We're going to look at theories of gearing. Before I will explain the theories of gearing, I am going to explain some bases that we might need in order to understand the whole principles of theories of gearing. Last week, when we were doing cost of capital, we made mention of the fact that your cost of capital will reflect your business and your financial risk. The moment your financial risk or your business risk or both changes, your cost of capital should also change. And as such, how are we going to calculate the new cost of capital? This is what we need, the theories of gearing, in order to be able to solve such um, issues. So now let's start by understanding some principles. We said cost of capital will come from the sources that we have raised money. And we all concluded that a company can raise money either by equity or a company can raise money by equity and debt. Okay, a company can also raise money by way of debt and equity. When a company raises money from equity alone, we say that company is an ungeared company. But if the company raises money from debt equity, we call it a geared company. So when I have to calculate the cost of capital, when the company is all equity, how will I calculate the cost of capital? We all said the cost of capital should reflect business and financial risk. And financial risk is coming because I have got debt. So if my company is financed entirely by equity, which is an ungeared company, my company will face only business risk. Because it hasn't got any debt, it will face only business risk. There wouldn't be any financial risk. If my company is having debt equity because it has got debt and it is geared, that company will face business risk as well as financial risk. So this is what we said will determine your cost of capital. So if I face only business risk, my cost of capital should compensate for only business risk. If I face both business and financial risk, my cost of capital should reflect both business and financial risk. So the examiner is going to use scenarios to create the question. For example, your company in front of you is all equity. And now the company is thinking of raising capital, but they want to raise the capital by way of debt. Calculate the current and the revised cost of equity and work. Okay, this is how the examiner will create a scenario. So many scenarios can be created out of this. I can be all equity, but I am going to raise debt capital. The moment I raise the debt capital, I change from being all equity to now be debt equity. So calculate your current work here and calculate your revised work. How will I calculate that? You need to remember, when I was all equity, I faced only business risk. So my cost of capital should reflect only business risk. If I move from all equity to be geared, I won't face only business risk. I will also face financial risk. Examiner can also tell you, your company is this company having debt equity. And now they are raising equity capital to pay off the debt. If we pay off the debt and it's left with only equity, then I am moving from geared to ungeared. Calculate your current 
work and calculate your revised work. Because I have paid off the debt, my financial risk is gone. Now I will face only business risk. Examiner can also say, this is our current capital structure. It is made up of, let's say, 40% debt and then 60% equity. Now we want to raise additional capital by way of debt so that afterwards our debt equity ratio will be, let's say, 50-50. Financial risk has changed. The moment the financial risk change, your work should also change. So this is how I want you to picture it. The examiner will not lead you calculate this, calculate that. He creates the scenario. You have to read the scenario, understand the movement between the financial and then the business risk. The moment any of them is changing, then your work is also going to change. The big question here is, which one is the best capital structure? Should we have only equity or should we have debt equity? The argument here is, our objective is to maximize the shareholder's wealth. So if our objective is to maximize the shareholder's wealth, and we all said from chapter 2 that the corporate value is the present value of the future cash flows or future free cash flows discounted using the work. Therefore, if the work is also coming on the basis of business risk and financial risk, then the best capital structure should be the capital structure that will bring the work to its minimum. The moment the work is at its minimum, the present value of the future cash flows will be at its maximum. And that is the point we will say we have achieved maximization of shareholders' world. And that is the argument. So the whole argument here is, should we be all equity or should we be dead equity? And what proportion of dead equity should we have? The answer is, which one of them will bring your work to its minimum? And the moment you are able to bring the work to its minimum, your market value will be at its maximum. And to explain that is what we have, what is called the theories of gearing. So these theories of gearing is going to explain the relationship between our capital structure and our work. The moment our capital structure changes, either to all equity or to dead equity, our risk profile has changed and our cost of capital will also change. The moment our cost of capital change, the present value of the cash flows will also change, which measures the value of the company. Therefore, now let's look at those theories that are actually explaining the relationship between the gearing or capital structure and then the work. The first theory we should think of here is what is called the traditional theory. And this is the traditional argument. The traditional theory, the argument is this. Okay, my advice is it's not the issue of the drawing of the graph that matters. It's the meaning of um, the whole principle. Because the examiner is not likely to tell you, explain the traditional theory or explain this theory. It brings in a question. You would have to see that this is what I would have to use to apply. So any question that is telling you about movement between geared and an ungeared position, and you want to know its effect on work or its effect on market value, then the examiner has brought you to the theories of gearing. Okay, so this is what the traditional people are saying here. Okay, the traditional people are saying this. I'm going to use the diagram to explain. But as I told you, we don't normally ask to draw the diagram. This is cost of capital, this is market value, this is market value, and this is your level of gearing, and this is zero. Okay, the traditional argument is that when gearing is zero, it means the company hasn't got debt. And if the company hasn't got debt, we said that company is called an ungeared gear company. And that company will face only business risk. So because it is ungeared and they are facing only business risk, equity holders 
will demand a return which is equal to the business risk. So equity holders will demand a return to compensate for only business risk. And at that point, this is what they will demand as their cost of equity because the cost of equity is the return to them. So where gearing is zero and we haven't got any debt, then we have only business risk. Equity holders will demand a return to compensate for only business risk. And at that point, your cost of equity should be equal to your work. Calculation learning point one. I've told you I am all equity. I now want to raise money by way of debt. Calculate the current cost of equity, current work. Calculate the revised cost of equity, revised work. As long as I am all equity, my cost of equity will compensate for business risk. And as such, my cost of equity at that point will be the same as my work. This is the common sense. We said, according to the work formula, your cost of equity, equity over equity plus debt, plus cost of debt, 1 minus T, debt divided by equity plus debt. So if I haven't got any debt, then this figure here is zero. If I haven't got any debt, I'm not paying any cost of debt. This figure 2 is zero. Everything here is zero. This figure is zero. This divided by that will give you 1. Therefore, where the company is all equity, my cost of equity should be the same as my work. Calculation learning point one, it should come automatically. Okay, so when I am ungeared, my cost of equity will compensate for only business risk and my work will be the same as my cost of equity. If now I want to raise money and I raise money by way of debt, we all know debt is cheaper source of finance than equity because equity holders take the higher risk so they will demand a higher return so instead of me raising equity and pay this cost i am raising debt which is cheaper to pay this cost that's why you see the cost of debt there so when i raise the money by way of the cheaper debt instead of raising the money by expensive equity i am going to save some money and once i have saved that money you don't conclude you save all of that because the moment you bring in this debt, your gearing is not zero anymore. Your gearing has come up because you have brought debt and you have financial risk. Equity holders are going to say, now we don't face only business risk, so we're not going to charge you this level. Now we face business risk, we face financial risk because we have moved from all equity to debt equity. Therefore, you have to compensate us for this business and then the financial risk. So equity holders will demand extra return to compensate for financial risk. So the more debt I bring for me to be more geared, the more equity holders are going to demand the return to compensate for the financial risk I bring. However, when you bring in the debt, the debt is cheaper than the e equity. So what did we say? You're going to save money. But that cheaper debt, the savings you made on that cheaper debt, resulted into increase in cost of equity. Traditional theory is saying that because you save this money and you incur extra costs, your savings initially, your savings on the cheaper debt, is going to be more than the increase in the cost of equity. And because that savings is more than the increase in the cost, your work, which is the weighted average, is supposed to be initially falling. So the whole argument is, when you bring in the cheaper debt, you make savings. But as a result of making that savings, you introduce financial risk. And when you introduce that financial risk, equity holders will demand extra return to compensate for that financial risk. And as such, cost of equity will increase. But the savings that you made is more than the increase in the cost of equity. And as a result of that, your weighted average, which is the work, is supposed to be falling. So the work will be falling as you are gearing up. And when you keep borrowing and borrowing, your debt becomes now substantial. The moment the debt becomes substantial, debt holders will not demand the same return 
because now the financial risk attached to you is becoming too much. Therefore, the lender or the debt holder will also demand extra return. For equity holders, the more you bring in the debt, the more you have introduced the financial risk to them, and the more they will demand. So it's always smart going up. So if your cost of equity is going up, your cost of debt is also going up. The weighted average you follow alongside. Therefore, traditional people are telling you, if you'll be able to combine debt and equity here, if you'll be able to get debt and equity here, that will bring the work to its minimum. Your market value will be at its maximum. Therefore, financial manager, look for the combination of debt and equity. That will bring the work to its minimum. The moment the work comes to its minimum, market value will be at its maximum. So this is what the traditional theory is saying. So everything that I have said is what they have explained up here for you. So let's go to the next. The next is going to be the Modigliani and Miller. The next is going to be Modigliani and Miller. Modigliani and Miller, they introduced their capital structure theory in 1958. They made so many assumptions. They made so many assumptions, including the fact that there is no tax. They ignored tax including the fact that there is no tax and this was the argument the argument is that this is your level of gearing which is measured by the debt equity this is zero this is cost of capital their argument is that when you are ungeared just as the traditional people when you are ungeared I'm having only equity. I face only business risk. Equity holders would demand a return to compensate for only business risk. At that point, your work is the same as your cost of equity. That one cut across. If I am going to raise money by way of debt, that debt is cheaper. So this is my cost of debt. But just the traditional people said, the moment you bring in the cheaper debt, you have to save money. But by bringing in the cheaper debt, you have introduced financial risk. Equity holders will demand extra return to compensate for that financial risk. The traditional people said, initially, the savings you are making on the cheaper debt is more than the in increase in cost of equity. So your work should fall. Mela and Modigliani is saying no. Mela and Modigliani, based on their research, said that the savings you are making on the cheaper debt is exactly the same as the increase in the cost of equity to compensate for the financial risk that you brought as a result of that debt. Therefore, your work is supposed to stay the same it's because whatever savings that you are making on that cheaper debt is equal to the increase in the cost of equity. And the work can't change. The work should stay the same. Therefore, whether I am geared or I am ungeared, whatever it is, my work is going to be the same. And if my work is the same, my market value should also be the same. So if there's a market value line, you, have, you would have seen it this way. And this will be your market value. This is your level of gearing market value. So according to them, it doesn't matter whether you are geared or ungeared. Your work will be the same. So as long as we are similar in all respect, we are two companies, we are similar in all respect, but you are geared and I'm ungeared. Our market values are supposed to be the same. Our work are the same in the same argument. Therefore, my advice to you is, examiner is not going to be mentioning Miller and Modigliani and the traditional theory. But the moment you read the question and you see movement in gearing, debt equity movement, then any work or market values they are looking for, examiner is bringing your mind on here. So Miller and Modigliani came out with models. They came out with models, which are equations. They tried to form the equations for these lines. And those equations are what we have actually divided it into three. We call them prepositions. So according to Miller and Modigliani, preposition one, which deals with market value. Market value, according to them, as we said here, 
okay the market value when you are geared is this when you are geared is this they are the same so two companies which are similar in all respect except that one is geared and one is ungeared our market value should be the same so they are claiming the market value of a geared company should be equal to the market value of an ungeared company when will i need this i read the question i am moving in between debt and equity i just told you like this the company is all equity they are now trying to raise money by way of debt calculate the market value now calculate the market value after if there is no tax Miller and Modigliani is telling you the market value when you were ungeared will be the same as the market value when you are geared and nobody is going to tell you you have to bring it up so as long as there is no tax the market value of the geared company will be the same as the market value of the ungeared the next one is the preposition two which deals with cost of equity it deals with cost of equity and Miller and Modigliani is telling you if you look at the graph cost of equity of ungeared is not the same as cost of equity of geared because of the risk premium to compensate for the financial risk so they're saying that your cost of equity of the geared is equal to cost of equity of ungeared plus the risk premium which is calculated as this cost of equity of ungeared cost of debt all multiplied by debt divided by equity so giving me this is the whole argument giving me cost of equity geared i should be able to calculate cost of equity and geared giving me cost of equity and geared i should be able to calculate cost of equity geared so when i tell you we are all equity for instance we are going to raise money by way of debt what will be your current cost of equity and your revised cost of equity? If I get my current cost of equity, it's ungeared. Will it help me using this equation? Come and put them here in order to come and get the cost of equity geared. So this is how the movement is going to be. This is how the movement. The last preposition that we normally say, and Miller and Modigliani, is the preposition three, which deals with the work. And as we saw in the equation or the graph, the work is not going to change, according to them, because the savings you made on the cheaper debt is exactly equal to the increase in the cost of equity, and the work should stay flat. Okay? So he's telling you the work of the geared should be equal to the work of the ungeared. So if I create any of these scenarios for you in a question, if I create any of these scenarios for you in the question, and I have to get the work here, the work there, as long as it is Miller and Modigliani in the world of no tax, which the examiner is not mentioning Miller and Modigliani, as long as you see gearing changing, then you need them. The work I have here should be the same as the work I will have after I have brought the dead, as long as there is no tax. Okay, so these are the equations you would have to learn them. Nobody is going to tell you, use this. You would have to know from the surface of the question. That is why I was trying to explain with this first, so that when you see the movement, the moment you see movement, either to be geared or to be ungeared, or from gearing to, to another level of gearing, you need them. Okay, so that is the argument. They were criticized in 1958 that... How can you assume that there is no tax? How can you assume that there is no tax? These are the formulas I've given to you. And as we all know, your work of the ungeared position is the same as your cost of equity. We all know that. Your work of ungeared should be the same as your cost of equity. They were criticized in 1958. So they came back in 1963. In 1963, they still made assumptions, many assumptions, but they came out with the fact that there is corporation tax. When they came 1963 and they relaxed the assumption of no tax, they brought corporation tax. And now this was the argument. They said, if gearing is zero, just as the same argument, 
We will face only business risk. Equity holders will demand a return to compensate for only business risk. And at that point, your work is the same as your cost of equity. When we raise the money by way of cheaper debt, what happens? We will make some savings. When we make the savings, we have introduced financial risk. Cost of equity will increase to compensate for that financial risk. Nothing changes. When they were in 1958, their argument was the savings on the cheaper debt will exactly be equal to the increase in cost of equity. So the work should have been staying the same like that. This is what they did in 1958. When they came to 1963, they said that we have brought in corporation tax. And where there is a corporation tax, interest on the debt is a tax allowable expense. So if interest is a tax allowable expense, then we are going to make an extra advantage by bringing in the debt. And that extra benefit of the tax savings on the interest will now outweigh the increase in the cost of equity. And therefore, your work should be falling. That's why you see the work falling. Okay? So when they brought in tax, because interest is a tax allowable expense, the work is supposed to be decreasing. Because the total benefit on the cheaper debt now will outweigh the increase in the cost of equity because of the tax benefit. Because of the tax benefit. And they still form the equations of these lines, and that is what you are more likely to use because the examiner is more likely to give you a tax percentage. If he gives you a tax percentage, you cannot assume Miller and Modigliani without tax. You can't do that. So when they give you tax percentage, you need Miller and Modigliani 1963 with corporation tax. So proposition one and two and three. Proposition 1 is going to be still value of company. Value of company. And that will be... Now, the value of a, a geared company will not be the same as the value of an ungeared. Because when you are geared, you will pay interest. And when you pay interest, it will save you tax. So when you save tax, your cash flows will increase by the tax savings. And as such, your market value will increase by the present value of the future tax savings. So the equation is the value of the geared should be equal to the value of the ungeared plus the tax benefit, which is the present value of the future tax savings on interest. And they said it's called DT. So this is what is referred as the PV of tax savings on interest. And D here, D is the value of the debt and T is the tax rate. That is the shortest way of doing that. So it's a formula thing. The only problem for me and Miller and Modigliani and my student is how they will be able to see that they need to apply Miller and Modigliani. And the clue is simply you seeing I am moving in between gearings. The moment I am moving in between gearings, then Miller and Modigliani is supposed to come in. So if I'm moving in between gearings, then the examiner want market value. I need preposition one. If I'm moving between gearing and I need cost of equity, I need preposition two. If I'm moving between gearings and I need work, I need preposition three. That is the argument. So your proposition two still deals with your cost of equity. And the cost of equity is this. The cost of equity of gear is equal to cost of equity of and geared plus the risk premium, which is cost of equity of ungeared, cost of debt, multiplied by debt 1 minus the tax rate divided by that. And your proposition 3 still deals with work. And he's saying now the work of geared is going to be less than the work of ungeared. Yes, the DT, the DT is the... D is the tax, uh, the debt value, and T is the tax rent. It's representing the present value of the tax savings on interest. 
is the tax savings, the tax you will save. Okay, let me explain that. You don't necessarily need what I'm going to do. But for the sake of that question, let me explain that. Assuming I have got 10% cost debt and the value of the debt is, let's say, um, 10000 and tax rate is, let's say, 30%. What will be the present value of the tax savings on interest? My interest, the cost of the debt will be 10% of that 10,000, which is equal to 1,000, okay? What is the tax saved? Tax saved is always the expense, which is the interest, multiplied by the tax rate, which is equal to 30% um, of this is 300 now. So if I've got 300, it means every year I am going to save tax of 300. What will be the present value? Miller and Modigliani made assumption here that debt is irredeemable. So if this is irredeemable, then from year one up to infinity, I will make 300 as tax savings, cash flow. What will be the PV of the tax savings? PV of this tax savings on the interest. Because this is going to infinity, I have got a perpetuity. Present value of a perpetuity is that constant cash flow divided by the cost of capital. That constant cash flow is the 300 divided by the 10% here, which is 0 0.1. And that is giving me the present value of the tax savings of 3,000. Okay? And Miller and Modigliani was trying to prevent you from going through all these hassle because this three thousand that i have got okay as the present value of the tax savings it can simply be calculated as the dt d is the value of the debt which is the ten thousand and then the tax rate is thirty percent 30% of the 10,000 will bring you to the 3,000. So the DT is the fastest way of doing this long present value analysis. So that is the reason why in their formula, they concluded that instead of doing all these to come and get the 3,000, you can simply get it at what? The DT. So the DT is the present value of the tax you saved on the interest because interest is a tax allowable expense okay so let's go back so when the debt is irredeemable don't waste time to go and do what i have done all what you have to do is just multiply by um, the, the d by the tax rate and you go away unless the debt is not assumed to be um irredeemable which we will see other examples Brilliant. So now let's go to the work. Preposition 3 deals with work and is saying the work of the gear will not be will not be the same as the work of the gear because of the tax savings on the interest. So the work of the gear is equal to the work of the gear multiplied by 1 minus dt divided by e plus d. Okay? My advice here is um, just as we did here, you are not expected to prove the formula. You are expected to use it, but that is the meaning of the, the formulas anyway. You are not expected to prove them. You are expected to apply. So the most important thing for me is, will you be able to see that I need Mela and Modigliani? The moment you will be able to see you need them, it is very, very straightforward. Okay? So if I need to move between gearing and I have what to calculate work, I'm thinking of preposition 3. I have to calculate cost of equity. I'm thinking of preposition um, 2. I need to calculate market value. I'm thinking of preposition 1. So these formulas are what you have to put in mind. Unfortunately, all those three formulas, apart from this, it's only the cost of equity formula, which is on your formula sheet, unfortunately. Okay, so this work formula, you are expected to bring it from memory and the market value formula of the market value of Angier plus the DT is also supposed to be brought from memory, unfortunately. Okay, so now let's go to our note, all these formulas I have given to you. Don't forget that the work of Angier is the same as the um, cost of equity of Angier, don't forget. Okay, so that is that. Let's take this example to illustrate. The capital structure 
Example, Grand PLC. Grand PLC, an all equity company, has on issue six million one pound ordinary shares at market value of two fifty each. Bell PLC, a gear company, has on issue seventeen thousand twenty five p ordinary shares and eight million fifteen percent debentures quoted at one two five. Taking corporation tax at thirty five percent and assuming that the companies are in all other respects identical. And the market value of grand equity and the market value of Bell's debt are in equilibrium. To be honest, this bit of the question will not be there. Mela and Modigliani assume that they are at equilibrium, as the formula um, indicate. So you won't see this. Okay? This is what you might see. As long as the two companies are similar in all respect, okay, we can borrow figures from A in order to do the figures for B. Okay, as long as we are similar in all respect and one is geared and one is ungeared, we can borrow figures from one and use Miller and Modigliani to help us to get the figures for the other. That is the whole argument. Okay, now calculate the equilibrium price per share of Bell's equity. Okay, if you look at this question, no mention of Miller and Modigliani. But I need market price of Bell shares. Bell share is this. They haven't given us the price. But the companies are similar. But Grant, Grant is all equity. And Bell is geared. Once again, I would have to tell you, here we are teaching. That's why we are guiding you. Exam room, the examiner might not tell you, this is geared, this is ungeared, or this is all equity. You would have to see. If you come to Grant, um, Bell's, Capital structure, you see that. As long as you see that, it means Bell is a geared company. When you see Grant, Grant has got only ordinary shares or equity. They haven't got any debt. It means it is all equity. You don't need to be um, told that oh, this is this, this is that. No, this is what makes it a bit tricky. So whilst you are reading the question, you have to be tactical and pick pinpointing all these ones otherwise you'll be skipping okay so as long as this has only equity it's ungeared as long as they've got that here it is geared now giving me the, the question that i need to calculate the share price of the equity of bell and bell is geared and Grant is ungeared, and they are all similar. Miller and Modigliani is calling me, and I ask, which Miller and Modigliani? Are they asking me to calculate value? Are they asking me to calculate cost of equity? Are they asking me to calculate work? Here they want price. Price deals with value. So it means I have to use Miller and Modigliani preposition one, which deals with value. Then I come and tell myself, there is tax. So if there is tax, I need Miller and Modigliani 63. According to them, the value of the gear should be equal to the value of ungeared plus the DT. Now, Bell is the geared. Grant is ungeared. So if I'm able to get the market value of Grant and I'm able to get the DT and I add to that, I should be able to get the market value of um, Bell, which is the geared. So what is the VU? VU is for um, Grant. And Grant, what are your figures? Grant is having 6 million shares and each of the share is having a price of 250. So in that case, what will be the value of Grant? I will say 6,003 zeros up multiplied by 2.5 and that is giving me, is it 15,000? Then I need DT. D is the value of um, the debt. Who has got the debt? Obviously, it is the gear company, which is Bell. And the T is the tax rate. So what is D? If you go to the question, the question is telling you that Bell is having 8 million shares quoted at 125. So I have to get that market value as 8 million divided by 100 multiplied by 125. Don't forget nominal value of the debt should be 100 multiplied by the tax rate. They said the tax rate is 35%. So when I find this, okay, so 8,000 times 1.25 is giving me sort of 10,000 times 0.35, that is 3,500. When I sum up that, it gives me the VG, and that is 18,500. 
when a company is geared, you remember from chapter 2, when a company is geared, a total market value is what we refer to as the corporate value. And we all said that time that corporate value is made up of value of debt and value of equity. So if they have got debt of 10000 then how much of the corporate value is in the form of equity? Because we wanted a share price. So you say less the debt value. When you less the debt value of the 10000 that brings you to your equity value. Okay, that brings you to the equity value, and that is 8,500. So the value of Bell's equity is 8,5. How many shares is Bell having? Bell is having 17 million shares. So what is the price per share? So we're doing everything in terms of thousands. So the share price should be the 8,500 divided by 17,000, which is equal to 50p. So this is what you're going to use Miller and Modiglianis for. Giving me this in a geared position, I should be able to get the ungeared. Or giving me the ungeared, I should be able to get the geared. So anytime you are moving between the geared and ungeared, Miller and Modigliani calling you. Miller and Modigliani calling you. Okay? So please, it needs practicing. Otherwise, the question might come and then you might not even see Mila and Modigliani. Most students read the question and they don't see that there's Mila and Modigliani. The simple example that we did here, obviously nobody mentioned Mila and Modigliani. The question will expect you to pick it up yourself. Okay. So Mila and Modigliani, they were criticized because they were assuming that if you borrow and you borrow, because of the tax savings on the interest, your work is supposed to be falling. And when your work is falling, your market value should increase by the present value of the tax savings. If you look here, the more you borrow, the more this will be the debt value. And when you multiply that higher debt value by the tax rate, the PV here will be more. If you add to this, the more you have as the market value of the gear. So Miller and Modigliani is telling you, you have to borrow and borrow and borrow up to 99%. Argument here is, can a company borrow up to 99.9%? .9 it's not possible because the more you borrow, the more you are likely to go um, on liquidation. You might not be able to service the debt and as such, your company will be liquidated. So they forgot bankruptcy costs. Do you think managers will use the company to borrow and borrow? They might be sacked. So there's agency costs. Okay, they might be sacked. There's agency costs. Even debt holders might not be prepared to give you that money. And that is what is called the debt capacity. So here, what I'm going to tell you is just read so that I'll take the time to do the complex aspect of it for you. Okay, when they came 1963, Miller and Modigliani, when they came 1963, they only introduced corporation tax. They forgot about personal tax that when somebody gives you money and you pay interest, that person will pay his personal tax. So Miller alone came 1977. Modigliani couldn't come. Okay, Miller alone came 1977 and then brought in the personal tax. Okay, what is packing other theory? I haven't even seen it in P4, but let me say quickly. Perkin is saying traditional theory, Miller and Modigliani, what are you people talking about? Because of the fact that when companies want to raise money, they don't have to sit down and do how many debt, how many equity should we uh, combine in order to bring the work to its minimum, in order to maximize the market value. But companies have got their own prescribed order. Of raising money and that is what is called the pecking order they've got their own prescribed order and the order is when they want to finance a project or something they look into their reserves so first money should come from retained earnings if the retained earnings is not enough then they have to go to the bank manager for bank debt and that bank debt could either be a bank loan or bank overdraft if it is not available or it's not enough, then they have to think about straight debt like debentures or loan note. If it is not available or not enough, then they have to think about convertible debt. If it is not enough or it's not available, they have to think about preference shares before eventually they think about ordinary shares. So they have a prescribed order of them raising money and that is what is called the 
pecking order theory. There's another theory which says static trade-off theory. All these ones are not there. The issue there in this chapter is how to see the Miller and Modigliani formulas. When to need them. When to need them. That's it. Okay. Static trade-off theory. Trade-off means you are setting this benefit against what? Cost. Miller and Modigliani eventually agreed with the traditional theory. When they came back in 1963, they said, yes, the capital structure matters. So borrow and borrow and borrow. Initially, they said, if you bring in debt, whether you are debt um, equity or you are all equity, your work will be the same. Your market value will be the same. But when they came and introduced corporation tax, they said, borrow more. Because the more you borrow, the more you will be able to maximize your market value. Okay, so they were in line with the traditional theory. So the static trade-off theory is simply telling you if a company is reasonably stable, okay, then they have to try and find the trade-off between the benefit of you bringing in the debt and the cost of you bringing in the debt. The benefit of you bringing in the debt is that debt is cheaper than equity. Debt is cheaper than equity. Debt will give you um, tax savings. However, when you bring in the debt, you are not enjoying those benefits. You introduce financial risk, and there is cost associated with that financial distress. And as such, you have to achieve the maximum when, at worst, you will be able to find that trade-off between those two costs of bringing the debt and the benefit. So you can have um, retrade, but there are no more issues. Gearing ratios, gearing ratios, gearing ratios. We all know how to calculate gearing ratios, okay? At this level, I don't have to take the time to show you how to do the gearing ratios. But gearing ratios, we have debt divided by debt plus equity multiplied by 100%, debt divided by equity times 100%, or you can calculate it as interest cover. Okay, and interest cover is simply equals to your profit before interest and tax divided by interest. Okay, so have a time and look at this primary school Then Nobody is technically going to ask you calculate this basic gearing. So I'm going to use the time effectively here by looking at this bigger two questions in here so that we will be able to move on to the next level. Okay, gearing ratios are just basic things. Right, so let's take these two examples and then we go through them. Bell and PLC. Bell and PLC has annual earnings before interest and tax of 15 million. These earnings are expected to remain constant. The market price of the company's ordinary shares is 86 pence per share, cum Dave, and of the debenture 105.5 per deben uh, debenture ex interest. An interim dividend of 6 pence per share has been declared. Corporate taxes at the rate of 35% and all available earnings are distributed as dividend. Balance long-term capital structure is shown below. Ordinary shares, reserves, 16% debentures, 100 par value. Required, calculate the cost of capital of Berlin PLC according to the traditional theory of capital structure. Assume that it is now 31st December 2004. Okay, let's do this one. When we finish, we do the um, canalot. Okay, the, what is the intention of this question? The intention here is let you know that if you go to the exam room and the examiner asks you using the traditional theory or capital structure, calculate what? The cost of capital. Nothing has changed. The traditional theory of calculating uh, cost of capital is what we learn and the dividend valuation throughout. So when you see using the traditional theory, calculate your work. It is your normal work. The modern form of calculating work is the Miller and Modigliani. Okay, so when they tell you using traditional theory, don't be moved. 
is the same way you know the dividend valuation approach so if i have to use the dividend valuation i ask the question where have they raised money they've raised money from equity they've raised money from debt i need cost of equity i need cost of debt and then i need the market value of each of them and i have to wait wait them together to calculate the work It's the normal work so when they say traditional don't be moved by any of the, those words the traditional theory work is the same as your normal work okay so how will i calculate my cost of equity if I have to use cost of equity dividend valuation, as we normally say, you need to ask yourself, is dividend constant or is dividend growing? Point of attention. According to the dividend valuation model, the market price is the present value of the future dividend. But whatever we've been doing from F9 up to this level, we assume that, oh, our current dividend is what we are using as the basis for the future. But if you go to the exam room and the examiner div divide, give you current dividend and give you the future dividend, you are not interested in the current dividend because the formula is telling you is the future. That is the reason why we said we needed the X div. And X div means the current dividend is excluded because we want the future. If you look at this question, they've given me current dividend that, that is currently declared as six pence. But question is telling me that all available earnings are distributed as dividend. And the question is also telling me the company has got profit before interest and tax of 15 million. These earnings are expected to remain constant. So if I'm able to get the earnings, which is the profit after tax, I have to di 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 distribute everything by way of dividend. So if I have to distribute everything by way of dividend, then my future dividend is not the same as this suspense. That suspense is my current dividend. Okay, this is the second reason why this question was brought there for you to know the meaning, true meaning of the formulas you are using and the dividend valuation approach. Okay, so the dividend you need in the KE is equal to D divided by P0. It's not always the current dividend. You need a future one. So if the examiner gives you the future as given here and he gives you the current, you don't need the current. You have to think about the future. So this is what we're going to do. So once my all earnings will be paid as dividend and they've given me profit before interest and tax, and earnings is profit after tax, whilst there's no preference shares. I have to pick this 15 million, deduct interest, deduct tax, in order to come and get a profit after tax. So if you flow with me here, you see that that is what we were doing for you. So we pick the 15 million, and then interest. If you look at your question, we have 16% um, debentures and the total market nominal value of the debenture in the balance sheet is 23697. If you multiply, that gives you interest. We want the profit after tax. And this is basic accounting. If I take the interest off, it gives me the profit before tax. Tax rate is 35% on the profit before tax. It gives me the tax. When I did that, the tax, it should give me my profit after tax. And we all said all that profit is going to be paid as dividend. And that profit is expected to stay constant. Therefore, I will have a constant dividend of 72.85. So if I've got 72.85, as long as the dividend is constant, my cost of equity should be equal to that constant dividend divided by P0. Have I got dividend to be 72.85 divided by P0? Because I use total dividend here, I also need what? Total market value. What market value do I need? I need the ex dev. What is ex dev? If cum dev is given to me, I have to convert from cum to bring myself to X. You see how I'm doing it? If you don't lead yourself, if there's a trick in the question, you are out. So when we go to the question, we're looking for the ex Dave market price. Question gave us, okay, question told us the market price of the company's ordinary shares is 86 pence per share, cum Dave. So if they've given me cum div, I have to convert it from cum to X. What dividend do I need? We all said to convert from cum to X, I need the cum price 
minus the current dividend, not the future dividend, minus the current dividend. But all we were doing before from F9 coming, we were giving, oh, current dividend is what we are using as the base for the future dividend. The, from this time onwards, if you pick the question, you have to be very careful. If the examiner don't separate them for you, you assume, as we were assuming before, my current will be the base for the future. But if they give me current separately, as here, they've given me the sex and they've given me the future as what we have calculated you need to be very careful so if i need the x dave this is the dividend that is just to be paid therefore my future dividend is not due to be paid so it shouldn't be part of the market price that's why we said the x dave should be cum dave minus the current dividend so i am going to pick this 86 and then i'll deduct the six from it in order to get my um x dave and if you go down there that is what we did for you okay so we said that the x dave this is the cum minus the current dividend that gives you um atp and then that atp is the market price we need a market value because we've taken total dividend and the number of shares is the one 12.5 million divided by the 25 pe nominal value remember and that is what they did for here which is the same as the 12.5 divided by 0 0.25 and that will give you 50 million shares so 50 million shares at the price of atp should give you what 40 and then your cost of equity will be the con constant dividend divided by the um, market value of equity x dave and that should give you 18.21 percent so the lessons you have to learn from here one is that when they tell you using traditional theory to calculate the work is your normal way and then when you are using the dividend valuation respect that dividend that dividend if they've given you current dividend and future dividend you need the future dividend in the cost of equity formula you need the current dividend for the purpose of converting cum to x if one is given you assume they are the same and you carry on with it next we also have got debt so if we have got debt we would have to calculate the cost of the debt then if we have to calculate the cost of this debenture our question is debenture you are traded therefore are you redeemable or are you irredeemable we saw all of them last week are you redeemable or are you irredeemable okay the question told us here it's not every time the examiner will say it's redeemable it's not redeemable here they gave us that it's supposed to be 31st 12 2007 when they put it here it's telling you that is the redemption day and question is telling us we should assume it's 2004 so if it's 2004 now and then we have to redeem it at 2007 we've got three years we have to go and calculate that internal rate of return because it's a redeemable debt we know how to do that already the market value per nominal is 105 x interest what will be your net interest interest is 16 percent 16 percent of 100 will give you 16 but there's tax rate of um 35 percent knock the tax off and that will bring you to the 10 point um 10.4 pounds so if you have got a 10.4 pounds come the end of the three third year there should be a redemption value you choose your own two red okay the objective of this question is what i've already explained to you remember traditional and how to separate a dividend the internal rate of return we know how to do it here already they assume eight percent and nine percent okay if i'm sitting down in the exam room i assume eight percent is giving me positive 0 0.70 that is more or less the internal rate of a 10 i pick it okay but they also assume the nine percent here we got these two mpvs and they are two red we put it in the internal rate of a 10 formula lower rate is eight percent mpv of the lower mpv of the lower plus mpv of the higher because this becomes negative negative and the difference between the higher rate and the lower rate is one percent and this is 8.26 we saw all this last week what will be the market value take the total nominal value multiply by the market price as usual 
don't forget to divide by 100. I've got 25 million. What is the work? My work isn't in the weighted average of the two. This is my cost of equity. Market value of equity we said is 40. Cost of debt because we had already factored tax here. You don't bring one minus T again. And then value of debt is the 25. 25 plus 40 is the 65. And this is your work. So when they say using the traditional approach is the normal work. The only lessons you need to pick there is how to respect if there's um, dividend current and dividend ward for the future. Now let's go to the next one that we would have to use the modern approach. Let's go to the next one that we have to use the modern approach, which is the Canalot PLC. Canalot PLC is an all equity company with an equilibrium market value of 32.5 million and a cost of capital of 18% per year. The company pros, uh, proposes to repurchase 5 million of equity and to replace it with 13% irredeemable loan stock. Canalot earnings before interest and tax are expected to be constant. For the foreseeable future, corporate tax is at the rate of 35%. All profit are paid out as dividend. Using the assumptions of Modigliani and Miller, explain and demonstrate how this change in capital structure will affect the market value cost of equity and the cost of capital. Explain any weaknesses of both the traditional and Modigliani and Miller theories and discuss how useful they might be in the de determination of the capital structure for the company. The, C, the B should be straightforward. They are just basically the assumptions. And of the fact that we don't live in a perfect market. So there will be bankruptcy costs, there's agency costs, there is um, tax exhaustion, debt capacity, and all that, as we saw up there. So I'm going to concentrate here straightforward. Okay. As I keep telling you, this is lecture note. There's a gap because here we are teaching you everything. In the room, examiner expect you to bring all of them. And as I told you, examiner is not likely to tell you using the principles of Miller and Modigliani. This company is all equity. Now the company is thinking of raising money by way of five million. Has, have we changed that equity? Because we were all equity. The moment we bring in the five million, we've changed to be debt equity. Calculate your work. Calculate your cost of equity. Calculate your market value before and after. That is how the question comes. But luckily, they've given us our market value now, which is before. They've given us the cost of equity, a cost of capital, which is before. But because we are all equity, we all know our cost of equity will be the same as the work. Okay, this is how you are going to interact with the question. So I have got my current figures. My current market value is this. My current cost of equity and gear, the same as what? My work the same as the work and gear. This is the same as the work and gear. I've got that. Now I should calculate my revised figures. What will be my market value? According to Miller and Modigliani, if I need market value, I need to think of preposition one. And preposition one is telling me the value of the gear should be equal to the value of the gear plus the DT. It's an issue of you seeing them. If you see them, it's formula. You do substitution, you move on. What is my VU? VU is the value when I was ungeared. And the question told us that the market value when we were ungeared is 32.5. I will need DT. I am going to bring 5 million. And the tax rate given is, um, where is the tax rate? 35%. So 35% of 5. 5 times 0.35 is giving 1.75. Therefore, 1.75 plus 32.5 will give me 34.25. And this is the VG. And this VG is the corporate value, which is made up of value of debt and value of equity. So less my debt value, which is 5 million, and my equity value is simply 29.25. If you see them, they make life very easy. They make life very easy. The only problem is they are not going to mention their names. You would have to see that I need, I need Miller and Modigliani at this time. That is basic thing. If I need the cost of equity, which is II, if you look at what we did in your note, we also use the traditional approach just for the sake of illustration. So if you have got time, you will see 
you will see in your note here that we also use the traditional approach trying to get the cost of equity for you we using the dividend valuation and all earnings are paid out as dividend and this is the market price but i am not even going to encourage you to even learn this because it's just too long Miller and Modigliani has made life very easy for us. Here we brought it for you to see that eventually what you can do using the traditional theory, you can do using the Miller and Modigliani. So when we use the traditional theory using the dividend valuation, our total dividend will be this and the market value of equity is that and this will be your cost of equity. When we use the Miller and Modigliani, we will come back to the same answer. So I'm not encouraging you to do that. As long as Miller and Modigliani is applicable, use that one. It makes life very easy and it saves time. Okay? So we said, according to Miller and Modigliani, the cost of equity geared is equal to cost of equity and geared. Cost of equity and geared minus cost of debt. Debt 1 minus T divided by equity. Okay, this is the formula you need. If this is there for me, I wouldn't bother myself going to calculate the um, dividend and all that waste of time. When, according to the question, when we are all equity, our current work, let's go back to the question, when we were all equity, which is the current situation, our work is 18%. And we all know when you are all equity, your work is the same as your cost of equity. Therefore, if the work is 18%, then my cost of equity and geared is also 18%. 18% cost of debt is given as 13%. Debt we said is 5 million. Equity we said is 29.25. I'm picking them from here. Okay, therefore, if I'm able to do this substitution, the rest is mathematics okay solve it mathematically that's it there's tax so you need to remember to bring zero point if tax rate is 35 percent this becomes 65 percent okay and when you solve this i have five times 0.6 um divided by 29.25 times bracket 18 minus 13 okay plus 18 and it's giving me 18 point is it five one or so 18.51 so that is how you would have to get your cost of equity okay so that is basically the case okay good so this makes life very easy for you now if i need three if you look at the note two we use the traditional approach if you look at the note we use the traditional approach work is equals to cost of equity proportion of equity plus cost of debt proportion of um debt miller and modigliani is there he gave us preposition word three and according to preposition three the work of the gear should be equal to the work of the ungeared multiplied by 1 minus dt divided by e plus d okay i have all the figures this is the same as the cost of equity and geared and currently our work or cost of equity and geared was given to us as what 18 percent multiplied by 1 minus dt d is 5 this is what 35 percent divided by equity is 29.25 plus the debt of 5 million and what will be the work if you had used the long pro approach you will still come back to the same answer that's why i encourage students see miller and modigliani save your time okay so this is what is going to give us about 17.08 percent about 17.08 percent so this is basically that chapter this is basically that chapter miller and modigliani we haven't finished with them we will see them again so have a go through them and then make sure you've understood the movement. The whole time you would need Miller and Modigliani is when I have to move between gearings. My risk profile is changing from geared to ungeared. And they've given me this and I want to get that. Either they've given me geared, I have to get ungeared. Or they've given me ungeared, I have to get geared. Miller and Modigliani calling you. Think about preposition one, dealing with market value. Think about preposition two, dealing with cost of equity. Think about preposition three, dealing with work. Which one is the examiner asking me to do? If you want work, I see preposition three. I move on with it. 
Okay, so that is the argument. Now let's go to the day's objective, which is starting with um, capping. Capping. Capital asset pricing model. This is another way you will be able to calculate um, the cost of equity. Last week I told you when they ask you to calculate cost of equity, you are thinking of the dividend valuation, you are thinking of Capim, you are thinking of Miller and Modigliani. Now we've known that if there is cost of equity and I'm moving between gear and gear, Miller and Modigliani per position two is calling me. So Either I will use the dividend valuation. If you look at the illustration that we did, we use the traditional approach, dividend valuation to get the cost of equity. We also use Miller and Modigliani to get the same cost of equity, depending on the information in front of you. So the third way we can calculate the cost of equity is using capping. And we all know that according to capping, which this formula is waiting for you, Capim says the return on a risky investment is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta market return minus risk-free. Be with me here because now I'm moving you from F9 Capim you learn to P4. Capim didn't say we have to use it to calculate only cost of equity. F9 syllables want you to calculate only cost of equity using Capim. We can use Capim to calculate the return on a risky investment. Return is from the point of view of the lender, and the cost is the, from the point of view of the company taking the money. Okay, what is the determining factor? What is the determining factor? Is the beta you are putting here. If I put in equity beta, I get cost of equity or return on equity. If I put in debt beta, I get cost of debt. If I put in the weighted average beta, I get work. Simple. Even though I would have to emphasize that in most cases we need the capim to calculate cost of equity. It's not only cost of equity that we can use capim to do. We can use capim to calculate return on any investment as long as each beta is given. So the beta that you put in is what will give you its corresponding word, cost of capital. So when I put in equity beta geared, this is cost of equity geared. If I put in equity beta and geared, this is cost of equity and geared. So the input is obviously the beta, and that will give you its corresponding thing. Okay? And we know beta is measuring risk, and risk in financial management is measured by what is called standard deviation the good news is portfolio theory is out of your syllables so that is gone but capim is assuming that when you diversify you'll be able to reduce some risk the third beta is the weighted average the weighted average beta okay we're going to see the beta very soon don't worry so the third beta is the weighted average. What, what I meant is whatever beta that you put in. So if I want work and I've been given the weighted average beta, I should get work. If I want cost of debt, beta of debt will be given. Okay, so the beta is what I'm heading towards. We said risk. Beta is measuring risk. But when we talk about risk, risk in financial management is of the fact that you your actuals might deviate from your expectation. A simple way I explain risk to students is, somebody will say, this P4 exams I'm going to do, I'm going to learn only four topics. That is the risk you've taken. If you go to the room and the four topics are there, you will pass and you pass very well. Same way, if you go to the room and the, the four topics that you learn, none of them is there, you also fail and you fail very well. So risk, it's not of the father you are losing. When I say I'm taking risk, it doesn't mean I'm losing. The meaning is, if it goes well according to what I expected, I will win big time. If it doesn't go well, I will also lose. So risk in financial management is the fact that your actuals might deviate from your expectation. Your actuals might deviate from your expectation. Expectation is measured as... Um, the arithmetic mean, if you remember your primary school, things that you did, you calculated uh, expected value as the mean. 
And in statistics, deviation from the mean is what is called standard deviation. Don't bother yourself. I'm leading you. Okay? So risk in financial management is measured as the standard deviation. However, when we talk about risk, we've got two types of risk. We've all heard the expression, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Because when you put all your eggs in one basket and that basket drops, you are in trouble. Just like this exams, if you put all your hope on investment appraisals and investment appraisal doesn't appear, you are in trouble. So don't put all your hope on one particular investment. What can you do? The literal meaning is that you would have to diversify. So when you diversify, there will be some point where you'll be able to reduce risk. So the risk, which is the total risk, we have the unsystematic and we have the systematic. We have the unsystematic and we have the systematic. The systematic risk, we cannot reduce it or we cannot eliminate it as a result of diversification. Whatever I'm saying is in the know there. The systematic risk cannot be reduced or eliminated as a result of diversification. If I have to bring it to your exams, if you learn all the topics, it means you have diversified. You are not what actually um, depending on one topic. But there's one risk in the room. Whatever it is, whatever, whether you learn the whole syllabus or not, that risk is still waiting for you. And that is time. That time cannot that time cannot be reduced as a result of you learning all of that. It's still three hours. That's it. So irrespective of the learning all the topics, you still have to face that three hours. So systematic risk, you cannot reduce it. You cannot what, eliminate it as a result of diversification. But the unsystematic risk will be eliminated or reduced as a result of diversification. And this is what CAPM is assuming. So when you come here, we've done the diagram for you. If you have got only one investment, if you put all your hope on only this investment, you will face both systematic and unsystematic, which is the total portfolio risk. But when you start bringing in more investment, your unsystematic risk will be what? Decreasing. Unsystematic will be decreasing up to this point. From this point onwards, whether you diversify or not, you are not going to reduce any risk because that unsystematic risk is fully what? Eliminated. At this point, we say the investor is having a full diversification. Okay, a full diversification, or somebody will say the investor is having a well balanced portfolio. A well balanced portfolio. Capim is assuming that the investor is rational, and as long as the investor is rational, the investor will want to operate at this level in order to remove all the unsystematic risks. So when you are fully diversified and you have removed all the unsystematic risks, you will face only the systematic risk. That systematic risk is what is measured by the beta. So the beta measures the systematic risk. In other words, beta measures the market risk. As long as you are in that market, you are in that industry, you face that risk. And that risk is of the fact that when the market return changes, how much will your return change? So the meaning of beta is that beta measures the gradient. It measures the relationship between the market return and your company's return. If you look at the capping formula critically, you don't need all this. I'm just saying it. If you need that the capping, you look at the capping formula critically, you will see that the capping formula is equation of a line. Equation of a line is y is equals to a plus bx. This is your a, this is your b, this is your x. Okay? And the equation of a line, this b, is the gradient. And gradient measures the relationship between x and y. So capping measures, I mean the beta measures the relationship between your company return and the market return as a whole. As long as you are in the market, if something affects that particular market, and the market return changes, your return will also change. How much your return will change relative to the change in the market return is what is called your beta. 
is out of the syllabus. That is when it was in portfolio theory. Examiner is supposed to give you the beta. Calculation of beta is out of it now. Okay, you need to really appreciate that it's gone because you needed a bit of regression analysis. You have to go and calculate the covariances and all that. You don't need it this time. Okay, so that is the formula. That is the formula. Now let's go to what P4 won from you. Systematic business risk and systematic financial risk. We said your cost of capital, your cost of capital should reflect your business and your financial risk. Now be with me. We call in Miller and Modigliani back. Miller and Modigliani combined their theory into CAPIM. And that is where we, we, we are now. And you need it. This is what you are more likely to be using in the room. So be with me. This morning, um, earlier, we said that a company can have only equity or a company can have equity and debt. When the company is having equity, we call it ungeared. When the company is having equity and debt, we said it's geared. If it's ungeared, it's having only business risk. If it is geared business and then financial risk. Okay, now, beta measures the systematic risk. So when I tell you the beta of this company, equity beta of this company, what risk will this equity beta measure? Okay, I'm going to talk about that. Um, Zongo, I'm going to talk about that. The, the formula they want you to learn is not the formula to calculate the beta. A beta will be given to you, and then we would have to move between geared and ungeared. Okay, we have to move between geared and ungeared, which that is where I'm heading towards. So nobody is going to tell you to calculate the beta. But you need the beta if I give you the beta of ungeared, equity beta of ungeared, and you want the beta of geared. That is the argument. Okay, portfolio theory is not in your syllabus, so we don't need to calculate the beta. A beta will be given to you, and you have to move in between the um, geared and ungeared. That is where we're heading ourselves towards. Okay, so now, ungeared. When your company is ungeared, when your company is ungeared, you will face only business risk. So when I give you the beta of that company, then it means that company is having only business risk. It beta will measure it only business risk. Now, when you go to this and I give you the equity beta of this gear company, what have I said to you? This equity beta of this gear company, because the company is having debt and is geared, it is having business and then what? Financial risk. Okay? So the argument is, when I tell you equity beta, please be with me because these terminologies can change your destiny. So be with me. When I say equity beta, you need to ask yourself, what beta is that? Is it a beta for an ungeared company? If it's a beta for an ungeared company, it will measure only business risk. If that beta is for a gear company, it will measure both business and then what? Financial risk. So this is what is called equity beta. Next, I'm going to come out with another terminology. When I say asset beta, asset beta measures only business risk. Asset beta measures only business risk. One minute. Asset beta measures only business risk. So when I say the asset beta we represent it like this is 1.5 irrespective of whether the company is geared or ungeared it is measuring that company's business risk so for instance if i tell you this company's asset beta is 1.2 what is it doing this 1.2 because i said asset beta 
even though this company is geared, that 1.2 is measuring only the business risk. But this company doesn't face only business risk, it also faces financial risk. So what should I do? I can't say their whole risk is 1.2. I can't put 1.2 in the capping formula to calculate its cost of equity. And this is where I would have to bring its financial risk in addition to that. And when I bring in addition to that, I will get their all data and I will put it in the equity cost of equity formula in the capping to calculate the cost of capital of what this company. That is where you will need to lead Miller and Modigliani. And Miller and Modigliani is telling you that giving me an asset beta, if I want to get a geared beta, then that should be calculated as this. And this is the formula we would have to learn, even though you can forget about cramming it because it is in, on the formula sheet. Okay? Forget about cram, cramming it. It's on the formula sheet waiting for you. So this is the formula they are referring to you. You are not supposed to start calculating the beta factor. They will give you one beta and you would have to get the other beta. But they won't tell you to calculate the beta from the scratch. So Zongo, this is the formula that probably you are talking about. Okay, so watch out. Okay, so this is the argument. So when I've been given a geared beta and given a dead beta, I should be able to get an ungeared beta. This is where Mela and Modigliani is calling you again. We said the moment you are moving between geared and ungeared, they are calling you. So giving me geared beta, I should be able to get an ungeared. Giving me ungeared beta, I should be able to get geared. That movement is what the examiner is going to play you. So the same way as we were doing earlier, if I give you a question and the company is all equity, and now the company is thinking of bringing in debt. I've changed. Now I will face business and financial risk. Given the beta here, this equity beta will measure only business risk, which is the same as an asset beta. And because this I have moved to have financial risk, I would have to bring in that financial risk. So I have to convert the business risk beta alone to beta which measures both business and financial risk. And that beta that measures both business and financial risk is what is called the geared beta. So that is how the movement is going to be. So calculate the cost of equity before and cost of equity after. I will pick this beta. Put it in the capping, it will give me the cost of equity now. But I can't put that beta here to get the cost of equity here. I would have to convert only that asset beta to bring in the financial risk in order to come and get the beta here to calculate the cost of equity that will reflect both business and financial risk. This is the calculation of beta that we need, but you don't need the beta from the scratch. So let's go to our note and I'll pick this one to illustrate. Okay, so remember, asset beta measures business risk. Equity beta might measure business risk or might measure financial and business risk, depending on the company in front of you. Let's take this example to illustrate. Gals PLC is an all equity company whose beta coefficient is 0 0.95. Stars PLC is a levered company and in all other respects has the same risk and operating characteristics as girls. The capital structure of Styles PLC is as follows. Nominal value, market value, equity, debt. The debenture of Styles PLC are virtually risk-free and the corporation tax rate is 40%. What will be the predicted beta of the equity of Styles PLC? Okay, it could be one company, it could be two companies involved. So the preposition that we did, when they give me cost of equity, I think of preposition two. They give me work and I have to convert it to, to geared work or ungeared work. I think of preposition three. When they give me beta, when they give me beta and I want to calculate cost of equity or cost of um, or work, then I have to think of the geared and ungeared betas. 
So all of them are Mela and Modigliani. So it depends. If I have to go to the preposition, cost of equity is given, and I'm converting it to the other. Or work is given, I'm converting it to the other. If they give me beta, then I have to come and think of this geared and ungeared movement. Okay, so now I need the beta of this company called, where is it, Styles, because that is the question. But it is similar to girls, and girls is all equity. And once it's all equity, it's having a beta of 0 0.95. This is what I was telling you, they wouldn't ask you to calculate because portfolio theory is out of the syllables. But giving me this, I should be using this as a basis to calculate that of the other company. That is all the movement. That's why that formula is there for you. Okay, so now be with me. They've given me the beta of a company that is all equity. That tells me that this beta is an ungeared beta, equity beta ungeared, which is also called the asset beta. But this company style is a geared company because it is having debt. And companies in the same industry, Miller and Modigliani is assuming all of them have the same business risk. So if this all equity company is having its asset beta of this, that asset beta is measuring only business risk. And as long as we are in the same industry, we are similar in all characteristics, style will also face the same business risk. But style will not face only business risk because it has got debt. And once it has got debt, we would have to bring in that financial risk. How would we bring that financial risk? Then we need the Miller and Modigliani geared and ungeared beta formula. Okay, so that is where you have to go and think about this formula. However, Miller and Modigliani also assume that debt is risk-free. So if debt is risk-free, the beta that is measuring the risk associated with debt will be zero. If that is zero, everything here is going to be zero. So in actual sense, in the exam room, the formula you are more likely to use is the asset beta is equal to the equity beta geared equity over equity plus debt 1 minus T. This is what you are more likely because we make the assumption that debt beta is equal to zero because debt is risk free. So when I put this formula down, giving me the beta of girls which is ungeared. Their beta is 0 0.95. So I will say 0 0.95 is equal to the geared beta because I need it for style, which is geared. So the geared beta, I don't know. Multiply by what is the market value of equity of the geared company. The market value of equity of style is 15. That of um, debt is 6. We don't need book values. We have to do it on proportion of the market values. So 15 and 6. So I will say 15, 15 plus 6. Tax rate is giving us, um, where is tax rate? Tax rate is giving us 40%. So I will say 0 0.6 here. And what will be the beta? No. Equity beta and asset beta are not the same. Equity beta could be geared or ungeared. Asset beta is automatically ungeared. So when I give you equity beta of an ungeared company, it's the same as an asset beta. Equity beta and asset beta are not the same. Asset beta measures only business risk. Come here. Okay, this is what I said here. If I give you the equity beta of a company that is ungeared, that will, oh, brilliant, that will measure only business risk. And as such, that will be the same as asset beta. But when I give you equity beta of a company that is geared, it's not the same as its asset beta because that will measure both business and financial risk. Brilliant. Okay, so how do we solve this mathematics? Okay, I know some textbooks do the change of subject, but the formula in the exam room is this. So it's an issue of um, you 
doing the substitution. If they give me this, if they give me that, I should be able to calculate this. If they give me that, I should be able to calculate it by using my calculator. So I will say 0.6 times 6 plus 15 times 0.95 divided by 15, and that is giving me 1.178. So this beta is the one measuring the business risk plus the financial risk of styles. So style as a whole will actually got the 1.178 as its business and financial risk. When I put this one in the capim, then it will give me the cost of equity of style. And I carry on from there. Okay, so that is the movement. That is the movement. You either have to understand it or you are out of it. Because the examiner might be using the terminologies. The examiner might be using the terminologies. He will say asset beta, equity beta. So when you are going to pick the beta, my advice is make sure you ask, what beta is that? Are you asset beta or are you equity beta? If it is equity beta, I have to hold it on it again. Ask the question, this equity beta, am I picking it from a company that is geared or am I picking it from a company that is ungeared? If I'm picking from a company that is geared, it means that equity beta is geared. It's measuring both business and financial risk. If I'm picking equity beta and it is from a company that is ungeared, like we picked the 0 0.9 from Gauss, and Gauss was, was all equity. That equity beta is measuring only business risk, which will be the same as the asset beta. If the examiner says asset beta, automatically that asset beta measures only business risk, irrespective of where the company is geared or ungeared. So if you don't look at the terminologies well, you might be doing your own thing. If I give you the asset beta, it's already ungeared. You don't have to ungear it again. No. But if I give you equity beta and it's geared and you want business risk, then you would have to ungear. Now, let's go to the next. Linking this to investment appraisals, we all said the work should reflect the business and financial risk. So as long as my business risk is changing, my work should change. As long as my... Um, financial risk is changing. My work should also change. Yes, equity beta is the beta associated with um, equity. There's also debt beta. Debt beta is the risk. It's measuring the risk associated with the debt. Okay, but normally we assume in this level that debt is having risk free, and as such, it beta should be equals to zero. But in practice, that is not the case. Okay, so that is the reason why if you pick the equity beta and you put it in the capping formula, it should give you the cost of equity. Okay, so here virtually we assume there's no dead beta, unless maybe the examiner specifically tell you. Okay, now let's go to project specific cost of capital. Your investment appraisals that you're going to do, this is where the challenge is going to start from. When you get your net cash flows, we said the net cash flow should be discounted using the appropriate cost of capital. The risk associated with the project will be either business risk or business risk and financial risk. It all depends on how the project is supposed to be undertaken and finance. If I am in, let me create a scenario again because always the way they create the scenario is what takes some of the students out. The examiner is not going to tell you calculate project specific cost of capital. Okay, so now LSBF is in the education industry. Okay, it work is 15%. It beta or equity beta is 1.5. LSBF is now thinking to do a new project in the mining industry. In the mining industry. Can LSBF use this 15% here as a way of discounting the cash flows in the mining industry to calculate the NPV in order to say, oh, let's go to the mining or not? We cannot do it because we all concluded that the moment business risk is changing, financial risk is changing, our work is not going to be appropriate. Our current work is not appropriate. So this 15% cannot be used to discount the cash flows here. We need a new work that is specific to this project, business and financial risk. So what will be the business risk here and what will be the financial risk here? 
The business risk and the financial risk associated with the mining is what we need as a way of calculating the cost of capital specific to the mining. So when you read your big questions, the examiner will tempt you by giving you this. And then he will be hiding things from the work, the way you have to calculate the work to calculate the MPV for the mining. What is the common sense? We all learned now that companies in the same industry faces the same business risk. So if I'm coming to the mining industry, I will face the same business risk as other companies in the mining industry. So what should I do? I have to go to the mining industry and go and look for a beta. And that is what is called the proxy beta. So let's say Z is in the mining industry. Z is finance 40% debt and assigned 60% equity. And Z beta, Z equity beta is one point, let's say six. Okay. Once the examiner said equity beta of Z, what has he told me? He's told me that because it's equity beta, I need to ask this equity beta, what risk are you facing or what risk are you measuring? It's telling me this company has got debt. So if this company has got debt, then because they said equity beta, this will measure business risk and it will also measure the financial risk. Okay, so look at the terminologies. Now, companies in the same industry will face the same business risk. Therefore, if I go to the mining and Z is in the mining and this is the beta business risk of what? Um, Z, it means I will also face that same business risk. So I can pick Z beta of 1.6 and because it is geared I would have to remove the financial risk. The process of you removing the financial risk is what is called ungearing. I'm explaining the stages they've given to you here. So first, go to the industry in which the project is supposed to be undertaken in order for you to pick a beta. When you pick that beta, that beta you need to ask, are you geared or ungeared? You don't need the whole of the beta of Z. Because the financial risk of Z is determined by the debt equity proportion of Z, for which I wouldn't or I may not have the same debt equity proportion. What I will have the same as Z is their business risk. So I'm chasing to pick Z figures in order to get the business risk I will face. So when I pick Z beta, and it is geared, which is measuring both this and that. I have to take this financial risk in order to have only the business risk. The process of you removing, you removing the financial risk is what is called ungearing. So when you pick the proxy beta, that's what they've done here for you. When you pick the proxy beta, ideally it should be the industry average. If you pick that beta and that beta is geared, you would have to ungear that proxy beta to remove the financial risk in order to determine the asset beta or the ungeared equity beta that measures only the business risk. So when I get this business risk, assuming we ungear and this is 1.2, that 1.2, I will also face the same 1.2 and that will be this 1.2 I will face. So that's a common sense. So when I pick that 1.2 from that industry, that is the business risk, then I will come and ask myself, will I have debt? If I have got debt, then it means I have also got my financial risk. What will be specific financial risk to me? The reason why you pick Z is not because of its financial risk, only the business risk. That is what we have in common. But financial risk depends on each debt equity. So what is my debt equity? If I have got debt equity, then this 1.2 is not enough because it's measuring only business risk. As long as I've got debt, I have got financial risk. I would have to bring in that financial risk. How will I bring in that financial risk? I would have to gear this. That's why they say re-gear. So when I re-gear and let's say I come and get 1.8, then that's the third stage here, re-gear. Regear the asset beta in accordance with your debt equity proportion. 
and when you rig here it will give me my business risk and my financial risk put it in the capping and then put it in the work and that work is what is specific to the business and financial risk associated with the project and that is what you would have to use to calculate um the mpv so watch out the examiner might hide it and he will just tell you the work of the company is 15 percent and most of them will just pick the 15 percent and go you can pick the 15 percent only when both business and financial risk are not changing the moment they will change the work will also change because if you are going to do the project in the mining industry the bank manager wouldn't say bring your business proposal in your education industry he want the business proposal in the uh, mining industry to assess the risk in the mining industry okay so go there go and get a beta to chase for the business risk there bring that business risk ask yourself what is your financial risk if you have got financial risk re-gear it and bring that financial risk put it in capping and then you calculate the work so i normally create a joke it follows five stages proxy and gear re-gear and work it proxy and gear re-gear and work it okay proxy and gear re-gear capping and then you're going to work it that is basically the case so let's go then we take this example to illustrate okay hot a lot plc produces domestic electric heaters the company is constrained diversifying into the production of freezers okay once we are diversifying business risk is changing and we know either business risk changing or financial risk changing or both changing what should change okay data on four listed companies in the freezer industry and hot a lot are shown below freezer glow code shiver all top piece and hot a lot face asset working capital financed by bank loans ordinary shares reserve turnover earnings per share dividend per share price earnings ratio beta equity the power value per ordinary shares is 25p for freeze up and shiver all 50p for toppies and one pound for glow cold and hot a lot corporate debt may be assumed to be almost risk free and is available to hot a lot at 0.5 above the treasury bill rate which is currently nine percent per year corporate taxes are payable at a rate of 35 percent the market return is estimated to be 16 percent per year Hot a lot does not expect its financial gearing to change significantly if the company diversifies into the production of freezers. Estimate what discount rate should what discount rate hot a lot should use in the appraisal of its proposed diversification into freezer production. Corporate debt is assumed often assumed to be risk-free. Explain whether this is a realistic assumption and calculate how important the assumption it's likely to be to hot a lot estimate of a discount rate in it should be a above for this purpose assume that hot a lot and four freezer companies all have a debt beta of 0.3 the lecture note is just trying to bring in in case they give you debt beta what the situation will be it's not likely anyway but we want to put you in a position where whatever the examiner will do you should be comfortable Discuss whether systematic risk is the only risk that hot a lot shareholders should be concerned with. Obviously, they shouldn't be concerned with only systematic risk. They shouldn't be concerned with only systematic risk. Why? Because if you remember, we said that CAPIM assumes that the investor should be rational. And when the investor is rational, then the investor will have a well-balanced portfolio and all the unsystematic risks will be eliminated. So we said the unsystematic risk will be eliminated at this point. And from this point onwards, we are fully diversified. How many different investments should I combine in my portfolio to say the unsystematic risk is fully eliminated? I wouldn't know that. There's nothing like that in reality. Should I combine 10, 21 million different investments? Should I diversify into 10, 1500, 1 million investment for me to say I am fully diversified? There's no straightforward answer like that. So CAPIM is criticized on the assumption that you cannot assume only systematic risk 
there should be some element of unsystematic risk. So investors should not be concerned only with systematic risk. They should also slightly be concerned with unsystematic risk because this is theory. You cannot get a fully diversified portfolio. Okay, how at what point can you say I have eliminated all this unsystematic risk? It's not possible. Okay, so that is what they want to um, test you there. Now, let me do the A, which is the case. A is what discount rate should we use to appraise this investment? This investment is telling us that we are diversifying into the freezer. We are in the electric heaters. We are going to freezer. As long as we are diversifying to another area, business risk has changed. So let me summarize it for you. The whole principle is when you read the question and you need to calculate the appropriate work, you need to ask yourself, am I changing my debt equity? If debt equity change, financial risk has changed, work should change. If I'm moving in between industries, business risk has changed and therefore my work should change. If I'm moving in between industries, at the same time, my debt equity is changing. It means both business and financial risk has changed. My work should also change. So this is how you would have to be interacting with the question. Because the examiner is not going to be telling you this, this, this. You read the question and you have to get a picture of it. The moment you see your debt equity changing, financial risk is changing. The moment I see my... I'm moving in between industries. My business risk is changing because the assumption here is that companies in the same industry facing similar or same world business risk. So if I'm doing A and I'm moving to go and do something B, business risk has changed. Whilst I'm doing the B, is it going to be fine? B is B going to be finance? That will change my debt equity. If that is the case too, my financial risk has also changed. I will need to use the new debt equity so we're going to apply the principle here to calculate the work here follow the stages first you need beta from the industry in which the new project will be undertaken because you have to go and chase a business race in that industry ideally you need the industry world average according to the question these four companies are in the freezer industry hot a lot is not there so leave it out first these four are in the freezer industry. Therefore, I will need their B test. So I will pick their B test. What is the examiner saying? Saying equity beta. If they say equity beta, it could be geared or ungeared, depending on the company. Is the company all equity or is the company having debt? If the company is having debt, because they're having bank loans here. If the company is having debt, that company is geared. And as such, their equity beta is geared. So all these betas here are geared. If they are geared, we want the average. So we're going to say this plus that plus that plus that divided by 1, 2, 3, 4. That gives us the average. So if you go down there, you see its trend. Okay? You will see its trend. So the average beta is this, which is 1.175. Once is the average beta 1.175 and all that equity beta were geared. So this is geared. If this is geared, it's measuring the whole industry business risk and the whole industry financial risk. Am I interested in the whole industry financial risk? No. What I'm interested in is only the business risk associated with the industry. So what should I do? This geared beta is supposed to be what? Ungeared. If I have to ungear it, I have to use the debt equity. We need that formula. I need the debt equity in of the industry. I need the debt equity proportion of the industry. What will be the debt equity proportion? Now go to the question. Go and look for all the companies in that industry. What is their debt and what is their equity? If you go to the question, you see here that all of them are having bank loans. So the bank loans, this plus that plus that plus that is what is giving you the total industry debt. And when you sum it up, Okay, that is what we summed down there, and then we gave you the total value of the debt. 
Okay, so that is the dead figures in there. What is 40.1? I've got that because I need the formula. The asset beta is equals to the equity beta geared equity over equity plus debt 1 minus T. We are assuming debt is virtually risk free, so debt beta is zero. So, giving me this 1.175, uh, I need the equity of the industry, I need the debt of the industry in order to get the asset beta of the industry. That is the whole principle. Okay, so I've got the debt of the industry. I also need the equity value of the industry, market value. So let's go. We all know equity market value is the market price multiplied by number of shares. If you come here to the balance sheet given, they said ordinary shares. These are nominal values in pounds. Okay? If they are in pounds and you need a number of shares, you have to divide by the, the nominal value per share. And they gave it to us here. The power value of ordinary shares is 25 for freeze up. So when I pick freeze up of 4,000, I have to divide by 25p. Shiva all. When I pick Shiva all of 3,5, I need to divide by 50, um, 25p again. Top piece is what? Um, 50p. If I pick top piece of 5,3, I need to divide by 50p. And glow code is 1. So glow code of 3, I mean um, 9,000, you divide by that. And you need to multiply by market price. What is the market price? Market price is not given here. But in F9, we learned that market price, or let's say PE ratio, is giving us the market price divided by earnings per share. So we all know market price can be calculated as the PE ratio multiplied by earnings per share. Examiner had given me earnings per share of these three. They've given me PE ratio of those companies. So when I multiply the earnings per share by the PE ratio, it should give me their respective market prices. And I will multiply by the number of shares. So this is what we were doing for you there. So flow with me here. Okay, so we divided the, num uh, the nominal value by each of them. If you remember, we said um, uh, freeze up. The nominal value was 4,000, and we had to divide by 25p, and that is what gave us a 16. You multiply by earnings per share and the P-E ratio. That gives you the market price, and that totally will give you the market value. So that is what they did to calculate the market value of all the, all the equities for the companies. Having got the market value for the industry, having got the market value of the debt, can I put it in the asset beta formula? Okay, so we got the 1.175 multiplied by the equity, equity plus the debt, and then 1 minus the tax rate. And you will bring yourself to um, 1.035. This is the asset beta of the industry. And asset beta, as we said, measures only business risk. So it means companies in that industry, all of them face business risk of 1.035. When I go to that industry, I will face the same business risk. I will face the same business risk. Therefore, I adopt this 1.035 as my business risk. Then if I adopt that 1.035 as my business risk as well, I have to ask myself, Fred, will you have financial risk? I will only have financial risk if I am having debt. Okay? Am I having debt? Let's go to the question. Am I having debt? And is it going to change? If it changes, I have to use the new one. If it doesn't change, I have to use the old one. And let's listen to what the question said. The question said here that hot a lot does not expect its financial gearing to change significantly if the company diversifies into the um, production of freezers. So if it's not changing, then my debt equity will remain as it is. So I have to go and use my debt equity. Have I got debt? Yes, I've got a bank loan of 17400 because the new bank manager giving me the money to finance the freezer um, activity will ask me, Fred, have you got debt somewhere before? I will say yes. What debt is that? I've got a bank loan of 17400 He will compensate himself for the financial risk. 
So don't say, oh, it's there already. The new person giving you the money will compensate because you say you would have to service that 17400 before you come and service the one that you're going to get. So if I have to give you the money, I have to compensate myself with the 17500 risk um, associated with it. Okay, so I have got that. So if I have got that, then I would have to re-gear. I would have to re-gear that. And to re-gear, I re-gear in relation to my debt equity proportion. My debt is 17400 What will be my equity? Same way, equity should be number of shares multiplied by market price. Mine, according to the question, nominal value per share for hot a lot is one. One, so that 4,000 share capital divided by one is 4,000. When I make that 4,000, I need to multiply by market price. Market price, they said, is the P-E ratio multiplied by the earnings per share. So it's the same thing that we're doing down there. Okay? It's the same thing. So when you come here, you see we pick the 4 million, divide by 1, which is 4 million, multiply by the earnings per share in the P-E ratio. This is the market value of equity. And this is the market value of the debt put it in the formula okay as i told you i don't normally want to bother you with so many formulas i would have still done P b a is equals the geared one equity over equity plus dead one minus t because this formula is not in the exam room this is what you will see in the room so i would have done now my business risk is 1.035 is equals to this is what i'm looking for equity we said is um 33.92 33.92 um plus the debt of 17.40.65 and i will say 17.4 times 0.65 plus 33.92 multiplied by 1.035 divided by 33.92 and that is giving you 1.38 as they got there for you 1.38 so when you re-gear it now this 1.38 is measuring my business risk and at the same time financial risk is it my whole risk if this is my whole risk i have to put it in the capping formula Okay, risk free, they said it's nine percent. Market return is 16, risk free, and the beta. And this is my cost of equity. Once got the cost of equity, as long as I have got debt, my cost of equity is not the same as the work. We've learned that. As long as I have got debt, my cost of equity is not the same as the work. Okay, so my work should be calculated. This is my cost of equity. Market value of equity is what we calculated up here. Okay, plus the cost of debt. Question said cost of debt is 0.5% above the treasury bill rate. So that gives you treasury bill rate of 9% plus the 0 0.5 is what? 9.5. Don't forget to deduct what? 1 minus T. And then value of debt, we said is 17.4, sum up the two, and this is the work. So this is what you would have to use to discount the cash flows associated with the project. That is why last week I was telling you, if you are not able to appreciate business risk and financial risk, cost of capital, you are out. Because those are the two things that will determine appropriate cost of capital for any particular project or any activity. Okay. The B is asking us to calculate or to come out with the argument that corporate debt is it risk free. We said Miller and Modigliani assume that debt is risk free. So if debt is risk free, debt beta is equal to zero. Okay? The argument here is that it is an assumption. We can't make that assumption in reality, no way. Because corporate debt is not risk free. A company can go into liquidation, a company might default. Even in theory, we assume government securities are risk-free. There's no investment in this world which is risk-free. No way. Sometimes government might even default. Okay? Therefore, how much companies? Corporate debt. You mean company debt. 
company debt can never be risk free. But Mila and Modigliani made assumption in order to make a theory. For every theory, there should be assumption. Otherwise, you can't bring everything in order to develop it. Okay, so they made the assumption that debt should be risk free to make life easy. So if debt is risk free, its beta should be equal to what? Zero. However, if the examiner tells you the debt beta is this, then the examiner is telling you debt is not risk free. So if debt is not risk free, then we will need the whole formula. Let me bring you here. This is the formula that we wanted. This is the formula that we wanted. This is the whole formula. Okay, this is the whole formula. And if debt is risk free, that is where we put a zero here. So if debt is not risk free and a debt beta is given to you, let me say it here. Again, we are teaching, that's why we are bringing your mind on in case. But technically, in P4, they assume that debt is risk free and you forget about this bit of the equation. But in case he gives you the debt beta, then unfortunately, you have to open everything. So given this question, we assume that debt is going to be having a beta of 0 0.3. So we can't do what we did earlier. We have to expand the whole formula. Okay? So we are going to repeat the stages again. We would have to pick a proxy beta. So when we pick the proxy beta, just as we did, the proxy beta average was this. The market value of equity, if you remember, is 192, 192. 40.1 and 0 0.65. This is what we did earlier on the assumption that dead beta was zero and everything there is going to be zero. But now, dead beta is not zero. Z beta is 0 0.3. So if dead beta is 0 0.3, we have to open up the equation. Okay, so it's going to be plus the dead beta, dead value. 1 minus t, market value of equity, debt value, and 1 minus t. When you solve that equation, you come and get the new asset beta. Okay? So it's the same stages that we are following. The only thing that we are trying to bring your mind on is if you go there and there's um, debt beta, you can't just look at the side of the equation. No. Because we have to open to bring it. The reason why we've been using this side of the equation is that we are making that assumption that debt is risk free and as such, it beta is equal to zero. If you get that asset beta, what do you do? Because our company is having debt, we would have to re gear it. And to re gear, we need the same formula. So this is what we say the asset beta is the 1.0. 7. Equity beta geared is what we're looking for. Our market value of equity is this. Equity. Our debt value. Tax. Then plus the debt beta coming again. We are not discarding that part of the equation. And then the debt effect and then equity and the debt. When you solve it, you come and get a 1.327. And this will measure my business risk and financial risk. Put it in the capping formula to get your cost of equity. Put it in the work. So what the B is just trying to bring your mind on is what I said, which is basically trying to tell you if they give you a dead beta, don't discard the other part of the equation. Bring it as part of it. But if dead beta is not given to you, assume it's equal to zero and forget about that bit. Okay, so our time is up. So I'm going to tell you to go through this again which is even good for us because when I come in next week, I am going to pick it from work of combined activities. And that is the same as, more or less, the same as what we've just done. So master that bit so that when I see you next week, we pick it from here and we go to APV. I know we are still behind because of um, chapter number two. Well, that was very demanding. So that is basically our um, calculation of work. And my conclusion is, you would have to check is business risk changing, financial risk changing. That is the whole argument. If none of them is changing, then we need our normal work. If the business risk is changing or financial risk is changing or both are changing, we, our normal work or our current work will not be appropriate. We need a work that will be specific to the new business and financial risk. So now go through that. Go through that. Also look at the 
situations where you would have to use Miller and Modigliani prepositions or situations where you would have to use this gear and ungear B test. If the question gives you B test, then you are using the gear and ungear B test. If the question gives you cost of equity or work, then you are thinking of the prepositions. Any situation you have to change between gear and ungear. It's either preposition or the gear and ungear B test. The whole answer is which one is given to me. If you've given me B test, simple, be geared and geared B test. If it given me cost of equity and work, go to prepositions. When you understand them well, I'll bring the two of them together for you, if you want. Because I can use this, get this one, and put it there. Instead of me re-gearing, I will take the beta and gear. If I take a beta and gear and I put it in the uh, capping formula, it will give me cost of equity and gear. And we all know cost of equity and gear is the same as work and gear. So if I wanted the work, once I've got the cost of equity and gear, it's work and gear. So if I need the work of gear, I can put it in the preposition three straightforward and it will give me the same answer. I don't have to go and do re-gear, cap him and work again, no. So if you understand them, you can bring all of them together. But if it is not all that okay, then I will advise you stay I'm doing preposition way or I'm doing um, the gear and, um, and gear beta way. So I would have to thank you very much. But our conclusion here will be that um, we should know how to calculate project specific cost of capital. And I'll do the work of combined next week and we pick the adjusted um, present values. So thank you very much for your time. Any questions that you might have whilst you are learning, you will be able to send them through the email. So thank you very much for your time.